ready for Perfect storm, perfect storm Oh, don't mind me. Big Katy Perry fan. I prefer the older hits like Teenage Dream personally, but this song Dark Horse is also pretty catchy. And for some conspiracy theorists, it's used as evidence that Katy Perry is part of the Illuminati. You know, the supposed secret organisation that pulls the puppet strings of world affairs. There are countless YouTube movies on the Grammy Awards. There are countless YouTube movies on, for instance, a performance of Katy Perry where all these conspiracy theorists develop different ideas of what is really going on in that performance, right? Her dress, for instance, there is this red cross on a white dress where they argue that this image basically refers to the Templars and to the original Illuminati. The black horse basically is referring to uh, parts in the Bible where the apocalypse is predicted, etc., etc., etc. That's Steph Alpers, professor of media culture at the University of Leuven in Belgium. The way that conspiracy theorists circulate Katy Perry videos on YouTube is one of his favourite examples of how conspiracy theories bloom on the internet. People use a lot of material, a lot of mass media material, to construct and literally visualise a conspiracy theory to convince people that are basically uh, watching these YouTube movies that these Illuminati are really a threat. This strikes at the heart of what the internet is all about. It gives everyone the power to create content and share their thoughts with the world. Steph says very few people watch things passively on the internet, whether you're a conspiracy theorist or not. People on the internet are what is called sometimes prosumers. And they are using material to basically tell their own story, to create their own narrative and basically construct their own conspiracy theory over time that will be picked up by another consumer uh, that has the tools, has the techniques and has the ideas to change it all over again. And basically, this is how a meme is created on the Internet. You're listening to the expert guide to conspiracy theories from the Conversations Ant Hill podcast with me, Annabelle Bly. This is part four where we explore how conspiracy theories spread and whether the internet has been a game changer in helping them go viral. Before we get to the internet, we're going to find out how conspiracy theories spread before platforms like Facebook and YouTube came along and gave everyone the power to broadcast their thoughts to the world. First, it's important to differentiate between the producers of conspiracy theories and the consumers, which philosopher Kasim Kassam talked about in part one of the series. The producers are often pushing a political ideology. They are also very good at dressing up their theories in academic language. Claire Birchall, reader in contemporary culture at King's College London, says conspiracy theories are often presented in a way that is difficult for the non-expert to recognise as bogus. And they sort of imitate academic research, actually. So what you'll find in like the really long published conspiracy theories is they'll use footnotes. There'll be loads and loads of footnotes. Or to take another example, um, in Fritz Springmeier's Bloodlines of the Illuminati, which is this kind of rambling series of writings on different families and organisations that he claims are members of the Illuminati, including Walt Disney. Right at the end of this really long, complex, dense conspiracy theory, there's a bibliography with a list of sources, just like you would have in an academic paper or book. This appearance of legitimacy is important for the initial spread of conspiracy theories. But what makes them really take hold is the people that buy into them, the consumers. This is linked to why people believe in conspiracy theories in the first place, something we looked at in part two of the series. If people believe a certain conspiracy theory, they are going to talk about it. 
Annika Rabo, the anthropologist from Stockholm University in Sweden, heard a lot of conversations about conspiracy theories during her many years of fieldwork in Syria. She says people are often performing when they talk about conspiracy theories. It's a way to show yourself clever in the way that you can talk and in the way that you, in a sense, can, can catch an audience. It's wrong to think that people are sort of only, in a sense, passive victims of such um, conspiracy ideas coming from above or only being a reaction to issues from above. You know, you, you present yourself as, as funny, as clever, a sort of a, a way to make fun of things. So that prosumer idea that Steph Alpers mentioned at the start, people remixing what they read on the internet and producing new content with it, that also happens when people talk about conspiracy theories in real life. Annika says that Syria and the Middle East in general has more of an oral culture than the West. So this is the main way that conspiracy theories spread, through people talking to each other. But I think that the basis of everything is an oral culture, because you want to have an audience. Conspiracy theories also depend on audiences. And of course, historically, the audiences have been the ones that you live your life with, that you meet either in the workplace or in the field or in, you know, in the bus or wherever. And now audiences and the way that we relate to audiences uh, might shift. But I still think that, you know, that the same kind of movement is involved. Most people still have a relatively small sphere of influence. We just probably don't talk to as many people on the bus anymore. Annika also points out that audiences are not mindless dupes. In Syria, where they effectively had a dictatorship pushing conspiracy theories from the top onto its citizens, people don't just hear something and automatically believe it. But that kind of conspiracy from above also met its resistance from below. But of course, if you hear something many, many times, you know, something will always stick, or at least the idea will stick that people are conspiring or that regimes are conspiring. And that looks different in different parts of the world, the way that sort of conspiracy theories from above meet conspiracy theories from below and how they interact and what comes out of it. As we heard in part three of this series, conspiracy theories used to be commonplace. In the 18th, 19th and even early 20th centuries, they were a normal way of understanding the world. One way that specific conspiracy theories spread was through good, old-fashioned word of mouth. Michael Butter, the American Studies scholar from the University of Tübingen, told me how conspiracy theories in the 19th century were even broadcast from church pulpits. Sometimes people preach to rather large groups and this had immediate effects. So for example, in 1834, Lyman Beecher delivers a series of sermons in Boston in which he accuses the European powers, especially the Pope and the monarchs of Europe, of trying to undermine and infiltrating the United States. There was a prevalent conspiracy theory at the time that Catholics were plotting the downfall of the United States. These sermons had an immediate effect on listeners in Charleston near Boston. They sparked a riot and a Protestant mob burnt down a Catholic convent. Sermons could be delivered to a lot of people, especially if you were a big name like Lyman Beecher. So when Beecher came to Boston to deliver a couple of sermons there over a couple of days, this was a big event. It's like a pop star coming to town these days. Not everybody goes there, but many people go there. People anticipate this event, a certain suspense builds up, and then he delivers something, and all this energy is then released in the rioting that followed. The fact that this is a religious setting helped to drive the message home. So it's religious leaders who are articulating these conspiracy theories and usually cast uh, the people they identify as the conspirators as the enemies of religion. And that is quite typical for the 18th and 19th centuries still. At the same time, the people who attend sermons are from all 
different classes because your religion is a uniting factor. So uh, you will have upper and middle class people in the audience, but you will also have people from the lower classes. And in Charleston, of course, it was mostly the people from the lower classes who then went on this riot and burned down this convent. By the time that Beecher was preaching in the 1830s, the new steam-powered printing press, or wet press, made printing much cheaper and easier. Lots of sermons were published in newspapers across the US, reaching much wider audiences as a result. So it's printed sermons, it's newspaper articles, it's books, it's pamphlets. It's also fictional narratives that are openly fictional and claim to impart a higher truth, saying, well, you know, I'm fiction, but what I'm telling you about the Catholics, for example, is still very much the truth. And then there are also accounts by renegades, by people who claim that they were part of the conspiracy or maybe an immediate victim of the conspiracy, who have broken the ties with the conspiracy or escaped from the clutches of the conspiracy and now have written a text in order to inform the world about all the evil that is happening. You also get this kind of thing today. People who say they were abducted by aliens and experimented on, or part of some secret government conspiracy. Some are particularly skilled at convincing others that there are conspiracies afoot and are able to capitalise on this. Journalist Anna Merlin talks about conspiracy entrepreneurs in her book, Republic of Lies, all about conspiracy theories in the US. People like radio host Alex Jones, who have made a living from pushing conspiracy theories. Michael told me about a story that basically went viral in the 1830s. I should give a trigger warning here, as this story involves allegations of sexual abuse. So... In this climate of anti-Catholicism that we have in the United States in the 1830s comes a woman called Maria Monk. She comes to New York pregnant and claims that she was for many years in a Catholic nunnery in Quebec, in Canada, and that she only escaped from this nunnery recently and has made her way to the United States because she wants her child to live and to grow up in freedom and liberty. And what she reveals is that horrible things are being done to innocent young Protestant women in these nunneries and convent schools, they are lured into becoming nuns. And even if they don't become nuns, the nuns very often are those who educate them. But all the time, these young Protestant girls who are the foundation of the United States, according to the Republican ideology of the time, are horribly abused psychologically, physically, and sexually. They are constantly raped by the priests who come into the nunnery, and whenever they get pregnant, they deliver, and then the child is baptized and immediately killed, which she describes in detail. And many other horrible things are done to these young women. This story was published, and it was a bestseller. It was only displaced from the top of the bestseller charts 20 years later when Uncle Tom's Cabin came out. So it sold something like 300,000 copies between 1834 and 1860. And it's completely made up. People went to this convent. It looked nothing like Monk had described it. So she invented the story, or the people posing as her editors then invented the story in order to smear Catholics and to promote this idea that there was a large Catholic plot led by the Pope against the United States. It didn't seem to matter that it was made up. Monk's story struck a chord with readers and was lucrative for her and her publishers. Very much like today, they were definitely also driven by financial incentives because she made a lot of money then from that book. She made a lot of money from speaking engagements. Her editors, of course, made money. And many other authors then piggybacked on this phenomenon. So similar accounts came out, both those that claimed that they were factual and those that openly admitted that they were fictional. So there is a huge body of anti-Catholic writing covering the whole United States in the 1830s and 40s and 1850s. This is a chapter of US history that most people have forgotten about. But Michael says anti-Catholic feeling played a big role in US politics and society at the time. There was even a political party, the Know Nothing Party, 
which ran on an anti-Catholic conspiracy platform. It got more than 20% of the vote in the 1856 presidential election, and Michael says if it wasn't for internal rifts over the issue of slavery, the party was a strong contender to win. I asked him where this anti-Catholic sentiment came from. Well, scholars have argued that it is actually driven by internal divisions within Protestantism. So the Protestant denominations are multiplying at that time, and they are to a certain degree at odds with each other, and they increasingly also run along class lines. And this, of course, was causing tension, and this was also causing concerns for Protestant leaders. And fueling anti-Catholic feelings, of course, was one way of uniting the Protestants against, because now it was not one Protestant denomination against another anymore, but it was, of course, now the Protestants against the Catholics. The 1830s to 1850s also saw the first major wave of Irish Catholic immigrants coming into the US. People were concerned about these immigrants. They thought that they were poorly educated, that they were behaving very badly. And also because they were Catholics, it was claimed that they were completely under the control of their priests and that they were something like an army that was secretly entering the country. And once the command to strike was given, they would rise against all others and take over power. This is all incredibly similar to conspiracy theories today, like the Great Replacement Theory, that's peddled by white nationalists. Instead of Catholics, the perceived threat is non-white people taking over. If you're in the US, that's Hispanics, and if you're in Europe, it's generally Muslims or any black or brown person. Technological change played a big role in the spread of conspiracy theories of the 19th century. Before the invention of the wet press, Michael says the amount that got printed was limited due to how expensive it was. This all changes then over the course of the 19th century, and especially in the 1830s, when the so-called wet press is invented, because this makes printing easier, and we do not only get pamphlets anymore, but we get larger newspapers that then contain sections that talk about conspiracy. We get a book market that is thriving, where texts like monks can actually be published and can be acquired by a large number of people. He also told me a great story about how the new printing press itself helped spawn a new conspiracy theory when certain segments of the population were not yet aware of its invention. It involved abolitionists capitalising on the new wet press printing technology in the 1830s. Abolitionists are these people who objected to slavery on moral grounds and wanted to abolish it immediately. Because of the new printing technology, the abolitionists, who never had much money, could, during the 1830s, basically flood the southern states with anti-slavery pamphlets that they sent to the south through the mail. Now, the people in the south thought that this was an indicator of a larger conspiracy because they did not take into account this recent innovation in printing technology and asked themselves, how is it that this small group of people has so much money at their disposal? There must be powerful agents in the background that support them and that supply them with money. And they came to the conclusion that the British government was secretly supporting the abolitionists and providing them with the money to print these pamphlets in order order to drive the United States into a war and thus to destroy an economic competitor. So a change in print technology, a change in media technology fuels a conspiracy because people don't see the change and explain things differently. Another reason that conspiracy theories spread is because they are entertaining. It doesn't seem to matter if a conspiracy is real or not. If it involves a secret plot, a cover-up and secret forces working behind the scenes, it makes for a bestseller or a blockbuster hit. We've heard about the books in the 19th century that used the anti-Catholic conspiracy theory of the time as their material. There were plenty more in the 20th century, along with TV shows and films. Claire Birchall explains how they reflected the change in attitudes towards conspiracy and conspiracy theories that had taken place by the middle of the 20th century. JFK's assassination played a big role in this. 
So JFK is assassinated. Actually, that's not a conspiracy, according to the official record. So, you know, it's a lone gunman. But it unleashes this plethora of doubt and interpretation about the event itself. So conspiracy theories very quickly become part of the JFK story. It's not that you have the assassination of JFK and then conspiracy theories over there. It's that actually during that period they become one and the same, right? You can't really talk about one without talking about the speculation on what happened. Then you've got the Watergate scandal. You know, another definitive moment where trust in government is exploded. (laughs) But you've also got the revelation of a whole host of activities that the government, CIA, the FBI, have been invested in throughout the mid part of the 20th century being revealed. And so people are becoming much more aware of the everyday conspiracies that have been performed in their name. A lot of literature and film engages with all this. The films tend to take a more serious approach. You've got films like All the President's Men, which is literally about Watergate, and The Parallax View, which is about a secretive organisation behind political assassinations. The literature takes a different approach. Claire points out how a lot of the literature of the 1960s, 70s and 80s engages with conspiracy theories in quite a playful way and starts using them as a device to tell stories. So the important thing about this literature is obviously it comes on the back of these great historical moments which undermine a sense of surety in the official story, in government trust and those sorts of things. But it's also a moment, an aesthetic moment of postmodernism, which is a questioning of certain kinds of official stories in itself. And it's also a way of presenting the fact that there can be different kinds of realities for different people. Thomas Pynchon, for example, writes novels like The Crying of Lot 49. It's about a housewife who becomes convinced that there is a conspiracy at play by the US Postal Service. You follow her down a rabbit hole trying to uncover this conspiracy. But, spoiler alert, you never find out if it was all in her head or if it was actually going on. It's not an advert for conspiracy theories, but nor does it denigrate them. Claire says you get a similar thing when The X-Files comes out in the 1990s. Yes, The X-Files. So, Dana Scully, fresh from... I don't know, FBI school, (laughs) comes out and she is assigned to be the partner of Mulder, Fox Mulder, who is known in the FBI as being a bit of a crazy, a bit of a paranoid. His office is even underneath all of the other offices. It's in in the cavernous sort of underbelly of the FBI. And the minute she walks in there, they have this confrontation where she's sort of ridiculing him slightly or poking fun at him because of his beliefs, and he is sort of poking fun at her very scientifically based theories of the space-time continuum, actually. But then throughout the whole course of that first episode, she becomes much more engaged and aligned with his point of view as she engages with a sort of more fantastical event that she can't explain through her own modes of discourse, her own way of knowing. She has to borrow some things from him. But actually, interestingly, over the whole show, they borrow from each other. This brings us back to the idea that conspiracy theories are often a way that people can explain things that are incredibly difficult to understand. I'm not saying that there are actually aliens that the US government is hiding from the world. More that fears of alien abduction often represent something else going on in society. Fears of alien invasion have obviously been around for quite a long time, particularly in the 1950s when the right, you know, in the Cold War and fear of communism. So... We can think about it as reflecting those sorts of fears. But then in the 1990s, we get an explosion of alien abduction narratives, which are often conspiratorial in the the way that they think about who's conspiring with who to, to keep this secret. And often these abduction narratives talk about moments where their eggs are being retrieved or something like that, or they're being implanted with aliens. And... One theory is that that is reflecting the newly emerging 
technologies around fertility at the time. So a lot of this is related to IVF. After the first baby was born from IVF in 1978, the fertility treatment quickly became more commonplace. And there were new developments of the technology in the 1990s. A more recent production that encapsulates the way some artists playfully engage with conspiracy theories is the 2017 film Get Out, written and directed by Jordan Peele. And what he does in this film is that he takes the way in which conspiracy theories have been long circulated by African-American communities about the condition of racism, so conspiracy theories that explain racism, that sort of give racism a face, because it's a, you know, it's an institutionalized structural problem. It can be hard sometimes to identify ways that African-Americans are targeted by actual people conspiring. So much racism is just built into the system. And so what this comedy horror, I suppose you would call it, does, is it imagines an actual conspiracy of white people against black people in the States where they take their bodies and inhabit them because they want to look, live forever. So it's a literal sort of embodiment of the black body. It's not just a fetishization of the black body, it's a kind of taking over of it and commanding it. For African Americans, their bodies have always been on the front line of racism, ever since they were brought to the US on slave ships. And we've got the slave body, but then we also have the way that African American women their reproductive capabilities and capacities are monitored in certain ways and regulated in certain ways. We've got the use of black cadavers for scientific research. We've then got the Tuskegee incident, redlining in the way that black bodies have been displaced to make way for gentrification. The body is the thing, right? So it's not a surprise that Jordan Peele takes the body and really thinks, ah, oh, it's not just as if black bodies are being used in this way. If people have good cause to believe in a conspiracy theory, then it's going to spread. That could be because it's entertaining, or it could be because it resonates with their existing beliefs. The way that the internet has changed the game is that information spreads so much faster online, and everyone now has the ability to broadcast their ideas. Here's Steph Alpers again. If you compare the internet with traditional mass media, say books, say think about a film or, or series, you could say that the internet is a medium that has the potential to democratize knowledge. And social media provides digital platforms where people can basically express their opinions, can say what they think, can say what they feel, also their political opinions. And conspiracy theories, you could say, is part and parcel of that. So on Facebook, through YouTube, on uh, 4chan or 8chan or Reddit, people can express their opinions. The platforms that people use to discuss what's going on in the world and where conspiracy theories germinate and spread are important. 4chan is an online message board site, and so is 8chan, which was actually created after 4chan moderators started banning people that posted illegal or exceptionally disturbing content. 8chan bills itself as a utopia of free speech. Its homepage comes with the warning. Some boards might have content of an adult, mature, or offensive nature. Please cease use of this website if you are under 18 years of age and or if it is illegal for you to view such content. The 8chan site was shut down following a mass shooting in El Paso, New Mexico last summer. The attack, which targeted Mexicans, was announced in advance on the 8chan website, accompanied by racist writings. It wasn't the first time this happened and the site was known as a place for white nationalists to share violent ideas. After a few months, 8chan rebranded and has since re-emerged as 8kun. Little has changed. Steph says the community element is an important function of these online platforms. So just to give an example, if we think about uh, ideas expressed by, for instance, the Flat Earth Society, 
uh, which is, you know, more or less a, a conspiracy theory that the Earth is not round, not a globe, but is flat. And that it's basically the elite that is silent about these things and de developing a conspiracy. This is not a group that is only there to express their opinions. It's also a group that are basically developing their identity around this particular idea. These spaces like 4chan and 8chan, where people develop alternative ideas in the fringes, are not so much only platforms, they are basically creating communities where people are just confirming to one another what they already believe. There's a certain dynamic at play between more marginal message boards on the internet and the more mainstream platforms like Facebook and YouTube. This influences how conspiracy theories spread and what type of audiences they reach. On the one hand, you see that these ideas that develop in the margins are basically flowing towards these more mainstream platforms. But on the other hand, there are also the actions of the tech companies in Silicon Valley, and whether you're talking about Facebook or YouTube, that are increasingly forced to clean things up and basically are deleting some of the stuff that is overly controversial or overly promoting hate and evil things, basically. So then it moves back to the corners of the internet, like, you know, spaces like 4chan and 8chan, etc., etc. What's difficult to estimate is the extent that conspiracy theories reach wider audiences and how many people are converted to believe in them. A lot of the communities online are echo chambers. The internet obviously makes it possible to form a, a transnational community in that sense, even if you're only with three people believing the most absurd conspiracy theory, you can find one another on the internet. So that is one element of the echo chamber. But the second element, obviously, is that particularly the big tech companies like Facebook and Google and YouTube work with these little algorithms. And the algorithms are obviously uh, the little programs that uh, record or track what we search as users, right? And basically feeds us back the recommendations that align with the things that we already looked for. So technically, this uh, leads to a situation where we are entering up in what is called a filter bubble. Not only does the internet make it easier for conspiracy theorists to connect with each other, these filter bubbles help solidify their views. Michael Butters says this is really significant when you consider how conspiracy theories became stigmatised in the middle of the 20th century. So just imagine 40 years ago, without the internet, you're the only one on your street who thinks that the moon landing was faked in a television studio. So the only people you can talk to about this are your neighbours, and they all tell you, well... I don't think that is true. I think you're mistaken there. And of course, you want to get on with your neighbors. We always have this tendency to believe the things that the people around us leave. You, they're nice people. They treat you well. So either at some point you don't mention these things anymore and you just keep silent, or more likely you begin to question your own convictions and come around to the official version. Today, if all the people you're in contact with in real life tell you, you know, you're mistaken and this is all wrong, you just go online and no matter what it is that you believe, you will find other people who believe exactly the same thing and therefore will confirm you in this belief. Add to this the effects of echo chambers and suddenly you're convinced that everyone believes what you believe and it must be right. The rise in how visible conspiracy theories are shouldn't be confused with them being more widespread, though, Michael says. Well, I think that this recent increase is also more moderate than we sometimes assume. So when we say that conspiracy theories were stigmatized from the uh, mid-1950s onward, this does not mean that conspiracy theories completely disappeared. It's just that they became a type of knowledge that could no longer be articulated with impunity in many contexts. He compares belief in conspiracy theories to people believing in magic or horoscopes. 
Many people actually believe that, but it's not something that you talk to to strangers. It's not something that you can safely use as an argument in official political discourse. It's not something that you will find in any serious media outlet. It's not something that you will find in the academic world. It's something that is uh, more private and that people only talk to with people that they know might think similar and they may not judge them. So what happened to conspiracy theories after 1950? is that I think they mostly disappeared from the public into fairly hermetic uh, subcultures where they nevertheless thrived and their knowledge always appealed to a certain number of people. So the internet changed the game in terms of making conspiracy theories much more visible. But another big factor has been the erosion of trust in official narratives that Claire Birchall talked about. This has exploded with the internet's everyone's a publisher model, says Michael. So we don't trust established authorities anymore who tell us that conspiracy theories are wrong and dangerous, but we trust the authorities, these alternative authorities that have emerged in the counter publics of the internet, these alternative media outlets that have sprung up there with their own set of experts who will confirm you in their beliefs. I think this is mostly what has happened. Steph Alpers has also seen how online community building can spill out into real life. So if you take the conspiracy theories about the Illuminati that I was talking about, they are frivolous, they are on the edge of entertainment sometimes. They are sometimes very much, you know, loaded with irony. And I don't think that people are actually meeting one another offline. But you could say as a sort of general rule that the more a conspiracy theory becomes a sort of social community or a social movement, the higher the chances are that people will meet up in real life. You get this with flat earthers. They have conferences where people fly around the globe to meet up IRL. People are not only talking about this flat earth society, but are basically meeting up because they they think they really uncovered something really, really, really big and they have to share it with the world. He says that the more social and political the issue is, the more likely people are to meet up in real life. Other examples obviously are the anti-vaccination communities. This is also really, really a hot issue and there's a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety amongst these people that they want to share not only online, but also really want to, they want to really want to bring the message offline. So here you see also the affinity indeed with, you could say, social movements, but also indeed with religious cults and religious sects in that sense. I mean, it's really a conviction. It's not only an idea or a belief. No, it's really a very, very strong conviction that we people want to share and they really want to convert other people. And it's here that things start to get dangerous. But just how dangerous? That's something we will explore in the next part of this series, as well as the best techniques for talking to conspiracy theorists. Psychologically, former terrorists and members of extremist organizations are not very different from conspiracy theorists. In fact, there is probably no radical extremist movement in the world that's not also involving a conspiracy. That's it for this episode of the Expert Guide to Conspiracy Theories from the Conversations at Hill podcast. Check out the Conversation website for some great articles on conspiracy theories by some of the academics we've featured and more. Thanks to all the researchers who spoke to us for this episode and to City University of London for letting us use their studios. Special thanks to Claire Birchall, Peter Knight and Michael Butter, who've helped bring this podcast into being and to the Cost Action Compact for funding it. The Ant Hill is produced by me, Annabelle Bly, and Gemma Ware. The sound design is by Eloise Stevens, with original music by Nita Saul. Thanks to you for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>